Du als Stadt. Sagte, du als Stadt ist äh, das, das Thema. Äh, wenn wir einfach von der Stadt, äh, wir leben in London, das ist eine große Stadt, eine faszinierende Stadt, intensive Stadt. Und äh, eben Stadt ist für uns Kultur. Ja, und wir machen Architektur, um eine Kultur zu, äh, äh, mitzubauen. Ne? Und äh, so deshalb heißt das also Architektur als Stadt. Äh, und äh, da braucht man so ein paar Raumkonzeptionen, wenn man das so macht. Und eine ist, das kennen Sie, diese Raumkonzeption, das ist das, die Idee des Zwischenraums. Zwischenraum ist, glaube ich, unser Lieblingsthema. Äh, 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 Spalten, Lücken, Leere, Intervalle, das ist wichtig für Architektur als Stadt. Und das sind so andere, noch ein paar andere Möblierungen auch als Stadt. Na, Maßstabsveränderung, Möblierung als Stadt. Und Landschaft als Stadt, wir können uns das auch vorstellen, und da ist ja auch der Scharun, den werden wir noch mitbringen, auch noch, dass der hat ja die Idee von der Stadtlandschaft. Stadtlandschaft ist für uns immer noch interessant. Eine der Stadtideen, Stadtlandschaft. Äh, und dann sind wir natürlich immer daran interessiert, wie man Maßstäbe variieren kann, das Maßstäbe von einem Maßstab zum anderen gehen kann, ganz beweglich. Ich glaube, das ist eine Architektenaktivität, äh, Maßstäbe äh, verändern. Und, und da haben wir irgendwie als Architekten ein, äh, eine Erwartung, dass wir das machen. Das, und äh, das ist sehr wichtig, glaube ich, dass man immer den Maßstab äh, äh, ändert. Und dann sind wir interessiert an einem infrastrukturellen Raum. Das heißt, ein Raum, der nicht fertig ist. Und ein Raum, der von anderen fertig gemacht wird. Also infrastruktureller struktureller Raum, wir trennen das manchmal vom Einrichtungsraum. Einrichtungsraum, das sind andere Leute, die das machen. Und das, und das ist eine Schwierigkeit für die Architekten, ne, dass diese Trennung, aber man kann aus dieser Trennung auch was Positives machen und das versuchen wir. Äh, äh, wir sind ja auch interessiert, in die, äh, dass äh, diese infrastrukturellen Räume, manchmal sind die bei uns äh, künstliche Topografien und wir heißen das auch das den, das den Teppich entwerfen und nicht das Picknick. Nicht unbedingt das Picknick. Ja. So wie, also das ist das Infrastrukturelle ist. Äh, äh, das ist der, das ist der äh, Infrastrukturelle Raum. <lacht> Äh, dann sind wir interessiert an die, in die Idee, das Künstliche und das Natürliche. Und wir arbeiten immer mit, diesem, äh, mit diesen zwei zusammen, weil das Künstliche ganz klar wird, wenn es neben dem äh, Natürlichen steht und andersherum. Und, äh, dann ist noch eine Idee, die Idee der Außenräumlichkeit im Innenraum. Und äh, das finden wir auch spannend, ja, dass ein Innenraum als Außenraum verstanden werden kann. Und dann ändert sich die Erfahrung in diesem, in diesem Innenraum. Dann wird das, der Innenraum wird dann zum öffentlichen Raum, zu einem bestimmten öffentlichen Raum. Und das finden wir spannend. Und äh, da machen wir auch, äh, das kennen Sie sicher auch, die Idee der Zimmer ohne Korridore. Gute Zimmer ohne Korridore. Das ist auch so eine, äh, das ist so eine <lacht> infrastrukturelle Raumidee. 
Äh, ja, dann ist es äh, noch zwei. Ja. Für uns ist es interessant, die Zeit, die Idee von Zeit sichtbar zu machen in unseren Arbeiten, in unserer Architektur. Ich glaube, wenn die Zeit sichtbar wird auf verschiedenen Ebenen, ja, die Zeit sichtbar zu machen, das ist was Interessantes für die, für die Benutzer unserer Architekturen. Und so wir in, 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 in dem Projekt in Lichterfelde haben wir uns also ganz da hineingesteigert, vielleicht etwas zu stark. Da gehen wir in, den geologischen, in die geologische Zeit und dann gehen wir in die industrielle Zeit und die mittelalterliche Zeit und die landwirtschaftliche Zeit, ökologische Zeit und so weiter und so weiter. Ja, da machen wir mit und wir wollen dann diese Zeiten sichtbar machen. Und dann sind wir noch interessiert an das, in, in, das Figurative. Sind wir in, äh, das möchten wir mal noch mal ein bisschen näher anschauen. Das hat sich etwas, das Figurative in der Architektur hat sich etwas, wurde etwas abgedrängt, glaube ich. Und wir sind daran interessiert, äh, Sorry. Ja, Stadtfiguren zu gestalten und architektonische Ensembles und Collagen zu machen. Collagen sind für uns interessant, weil wir nicht alles von Anfang an vom Adam und Eva entwerfen wollen. Wenn da was Interessantes und Gutes und Intelligentes da außen ist, dann möchten wir mit dem arbeiten. Das brauchen wir nicht dann auch nochmal entwerfen. Aber dann muss man solche äh, Sammlungen, ja, Collage-Sammlungen, die muss man dann, die muss man eben dann kol, äh, komponieren. Ja? Und äh, da, das ist interessant. So, und wir arbeiten mit historischen äh, bei Beispielen. Und wir äh, machen Übersetzungen, entwerfen Übersetzungen für, für den gegenwärtigen Kontext dieser vergangenen Ideen ja. und diese städtebauliche Konzeption des Weiterschreibens des Vergangenen, nicht unbedingt das Historische des Vergangenen, und eine Kontinuität zu schaffen, aufzuzeigen und Großzügigkeit zu erringen, da, ja, das macht dann, da kommt man dann zum Zivilen, ja, dass man offerieren könnte vielleicht ein bisschen. Ja. Das sind solche Ideen. Ja. Jetzt kommen wir mit den Projekten. Ja. Okay, so um, we're going to go through that in a way again, in a different order, um, with some um, images. And, um, but Florian just wanted to give you that in German to... Um, give you a kind of overview. Um, we're looking at um, the early medieval uh, drawing that still exists of the um, monastery plan of St. Gallen. And um, from what we know of this, it's an ideal city. So we're going to, I mean, all these things that, are, that Florian just has um, gone through is um, our, our interests as architects, but they all have something to do with the city. In the end, they're, um, we're making not only buildings, but we're making the city. We're all making the city as architects. And we're, so all of these spatial ideas and um, concepts are not only for the scale of the building, not uh, only for the um, urban scale, but they're making for the city. So here's an ideal version of the city. Here's another uh, um, drawing of that, where um, all the functions and all the types of spaces are somehow um, a constellation arrangement um, uh, as a kind of ideal. Um, when we come to this, when it gets built in different places in the world, for example, this is in Florence, and we're looking at the section through 
the Michelangelo Laurentian Library here and the staircase in the complex of San Lorenzo um, Cathedral and Monastery Cloister. Um, here, of course, the ideal is never complete. And it's a, it's a montage of many times and many um, eras and many people. And so the, uh, this one is when it really becomes city. Uh, this is where um, Michelangelo has um, fitted in his intervention into already a very complex um, context, a very urban context. <clears throat> and he's done it um, in a way which the new intervention is, has an integrity and an independence, and it has given another layer of... Um, of, of, of the city, which has made it even better, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a, a, a painting. You, you might know this painting. Huh? <coughs> uh, it's called, what is it? San Jerome. Huh? See? Study. It's an early Renaissance painting. Uh, San Jerome in his study. And we like this painting a lot. And the best reason why we like this painting such a lot is because uh, it has an idea of city. Yes. And this idea of city is, uh, is generated by uh, putting different scales into this, uh, into, into this painting. And uh, there is uh, the first the idea of the study. Yeah? Uh, and the study is inside the big uh, vaulted room, so that's the next scale. And then uh, the study is uh, based on a sort of bridge. Uh, on that, an other scale. And then there is, when you look at these windows, there is a horizon, and there is the art that joins up this horizon. And this is another scale. And that really makes this space really very charged, and uh, lots of uh, energy in this space. <coughs> yeah, this is, of course. Another idea of city, huh? uh, and also on different scales. Huh? Sharon with his library. Huh? So the library makes a kind of a city, uh, a little city, together with the National Gallery, and uh, and that's now other buildings. Uh, so there is a sort of cultures, cultural cluster in the city. Huh? And one of the clusters is this one of the pieces in the cluster is that one, and uh, that has an idea about the presence of this uh, library in in the city, and it's this idea, which I think he describes as a big rock, a big a big filzen. No? in the landscape of the city. Next. <coughs> and under is the lid. Uh, and under the lid is this another city. That is the inside city. Uh, and uh, that is a, there is a, a, a topography inside. Uh, and on this topography are these shelves laid out. But they are laid out not just as ordinary shelves. The shelves make gaps and uh, voids. And this becomes the shelf city. And uh, that's it. And I think this is still an incredibly uh, valid idea. 
and this is at night, yeah, and then you really think this is a city when you look down on it. And that's another uh, inside city, uh, in and around, uh, is overtaken from exterior ideas. And the idea here is this is a existing space of an old uh, factory. A factory for shoes. Uh, and this is, has been uh, changed into a living place. And there are a number of furnitures. These uh, pieces of piece of furniture, and there is this piece of furniture here. Uh, and there is uh, this piece of furniture here. And these are furnitures, but see, when you look at the uh, form of these things, they look a little bit like small buildings. And uh, and these small buildings are arranged in such a way that they come between these existing columns and they sort of string themselves like that between the columns and they form kind of flowing space between themselves. It's a bit like a floating floating ensemble huh? on a part of town. Yeah. And uh, these are these flowing spaces uh, and between uh, uh, the columns, uh, the columns. And uh, I think that works very well. And we have made a project that is a real sort of project in a large artificial lake we got that picture at uh, this drawing. No, we don't. Sorry. Uh, first mishap. Uh, and then there is this uh, another sort of uh, city or part, city within the city, which is Lemerance. Uh, I don't know if I'm sure you, many of you will know this. This is uh, Malmö Cemetery. And uh, he has sort of uh, shaped topography so that there is a, a, an edge here between this uh, topography and the uh, topography down there. Uh, and it is getting sort of ready for inhabitation with the tombs. F next and picture. That, that edge that we were looking at that edge. is along that line there. And it's an, it was an existing ridge in the landscape when he, before he started. A little ridge in a, quite a flat land. And along that ridge, there was already a, a kind of mound that maybe was an ancient burial mound. It's, it's halfway down. And what he's done with this project this is an early drawing. It's, uh, it's not exactly as it was built. He, uh, this is the ridge along here. And he made the main sort of uh, backbone, a kind of big uh, road there. And, and you could go out to a gate there and a gate at this end. And there, there's a burial mound here with, in, in, in the trees. And what he did with that, that ridge is he, he, he strengthened it. He kind of reinforced it by, by making this artificial topography, making it a little bit more firm and artificial. The burial mound is there in the trees, and the edges of this, these fields here, these sort of empty fields, are the, the um, sharp edges of this, of this topography. Whoops. And inside, inside these, then from that main ridge are these little avenues, the little streets, each of them slightly different from each other, coming to these burial fields, like a city plan, but it looks like a city plan. And in, within them, they are like this. The, the trees are the architecture. I mean, he's made this city with uh, the vegetation. It's very, very um, imaginative and very, very spatial. But it is like a little city. 
you go on. Then um, this Florian described that this idea about time. Time is really, really important in architecture, and it's, it's, it's also very important when thinking about the city. Um, this is a representation um, of a one, ev one night's event, a kind of uh, little city made for one night, for, a, for a, 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 big party. a big party in Korea in the late 19th century, where this is the river and the, and the wall next to the river, and that's the horizon. And this is a, a roof here, and in, these are a kind of walled enclosures made of fabric uh, for this large feast. And um, so you could say that that's a city that's, the time is very, very short. And you would know this, this is well known, this is uh, uh, Dimitri Picionis' um, project in Athens for the pavements that were, he was commissioned to make in the, in the 1950s to go um, up to the Acropolis. Um, and this is looking from the Philippapu Hill, the hill opposite the Acropolis Hill, where he also made the, a pathway going up to the other side. So you, we're looking from the other hill across. This is a project where the um, architecture is um, like a drawing of time. He's drawing the city on the ground with, this, with these stones. Um, and he's using, with the materials that he's using to make this drawing are the re remains of the city of Athens that was being destroyed and rebuilt at that time. So these are stones from kitchen sinks and um, pav pavements and ancient stones that were here on the site and so on. A lot of buildings were being demolished and rebuilt at that time. So he's making, um, and in the uh, composition of this, um, these paths, when you look down at the floor, it's a kind of representation of the city plan in different, excuse me, different scales and different um, uh, imaginations of, of, of city plans. So there's a lot of time in this. There you can see it in more closer and down by where it meets the, the road um, in the actual city. Okay, this is our favorite subject, this Savoid. Huh? It's Christian Rome. Huh? And uh, this is a drawing by a guy called, uh, um, what is his name? Giorgio Morandi. Giorgio Ma Morandi. Yeah? Uh, and uh, he has this, uh, I don't know whether you know, some of you might definitely know, uh, there was a sort of 30s, 50s in, in, in Bologna, in Italy, where he worked. And uh, lots of people called his work uh, Drawing the City of Bologna in his way. And what he's doing, he's uh, putting every, for every painting a kind of city of vases and bottles and tea caddies on the table uh, and uh, has every day a different light, obviously, and a different time. Uh, and he does these uh, things. And by drawing, the, by drawing the space in between, uh, and I think this drawing the space in between makes the uh, object uh, more strong uh, and uh, gives it more its I, its particular meaning and power. Uh, and uh, so I think thinking about this, about the shape of the space in between, you give uh, strength uh, to the to the positive things. <coughs> and. Uh, so there is the edge of the table, which is the horizon. There are sort of more sort of uh, orthogonal things, but of course not orthogonal. Uh, uh, and there are sort of more complicated things. Uh, and so this is kind of family of forms, uh, which is also interesting. 
and they have these gaps, yeah, and the gaps, the gaps, the gaps, and the color is very soft and very gentle, huh? and uh, I think uh, we really like this. So in, in this way, it's, of course, very architectural, this, this, the, the work of Mirandi, um, because it's about relationships between figures or between um, things. It's the, it's, the, it's the space between them is about relationships. They're, each of them have a different character. This, these two are sli slightly similar, and they're completely different from this special one. This one is a little bit special, but in the background, and this one on the side. And these three on the front are like brothers and sisters, but not quite the same. It's a family of uh, relationships between figures. That's when he's drawing um, actual buildings and the space between buildings. So he's, 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 I think he's also thinking, so many people have said he's actually drawing the city of Bologna when he's making his paintings. Yeah, there's a project in Korea. Uh, it's for a jazz uh, enthusiast and also uh, I mean, what I mean by that is he uh, uh, has a, a wide horizon uh, person. And uh, so we said to him, we would want to make a group on the space in between. Uh, so he w uh, went along with this. And, uh, and uh, he loves this thing. Uh, these are these very transparent uh, bodies, uh, how light, how uh, space is lit by this idea. That <coughs> and there's another one of this different shape. Uh, and this is a bit more complex uh, from this. <coughs> and this is another one in Korea. This is. Uh, an office uh, space for a agency of uh, what is it advertisers. called? Advertising agency, <coughs> and uh, that's the neighbor, uh, a typical uh, glass box, and we have uh, uh, persuaded these people to make this, break this up, and make kind of uh, office houses. Office village, <coughs> and so we uh, we do a, a Morandi after the space in between is uh, formed by positively to make that space, <coughs> and that's a, such a gap. You see, there are sort of staircases in open just open air staircases between the office houses and. You can look into the city by smoking a cigarette, uh, and then you go back to your studio. That is another, yeah, that is our first project, 1985. And the, we are still working on that. We haven't changed, you know. We have not changed. <laughs> We're not dancing about with our philosophies. And <coughs> so, this was the space between these uh, uh, <coughs> galleries, and <coughs> and that's a curtain, yeah? and it's in the real city. Yeah? And when you walk out there, you walk out to the Mile End Road, which is uh, the biggest road in the east end of London. And, and when we opened this theater, we had uh, this space, this curtain is also on the other side, behind me. Yeah? Uh, so we have uh, had horses coming through this space. There's lots of people are walking in and going out, and everybody understood that. Ah, that's what it is. And uh, street theater. Huh? And uh, so it's still there. Uh, when Wilfried Wang said he would come along, because he is a, f a friend of ours, and he was working on this project. And this project has a little child. Uh, and that was really quite a lot designed by Wilfried. 
it's this one. It's this one. And that's this main theater. Uh, and that is the street. It's in the open here. And goes past a kind of entrance tower. And that goes to, uh, when you go through the big door, uh, and through the other big door, on the other side, you come into, into a cemetery. And it's really, it's really urban. Uh, and this, uh, this pavement is very lively. Uh, and it's big pavement for London uh, conditions. <coughs> so um, yeah. you can do the mile and well, Okay, well, so we're going to, that's just kind of, that's uh, some of our interests and, and uh, kind of background to the, some of the projects we're going to show you. Uh, that's a very archaic space. That's why it survives. Uh, the uh, the Half Moon Theatre. And I think that, that it's sort of archaic. It's in it's not, it's it's a, a interesting uh, an interesting thing. Okay, this is a, a, a small project we did. We didn't ha we did not um, win the uh, project to um, to complete it. Somebody else did, but um, it was a proposal for. This is the Half Moon Theatre here, and this is the Mile End Road that Florian was speaking about. We're looking towards the city of London here, looking west down this old Roman road, which was um, going from the city out eastward to to the east coast in the Roman times. And, um, and it, where those trees are there is the site of a project which we were trying to get a, uh, to do, which is this place here. The road widens uh, there. You, could, uh, you can see it's, it gets wider, and it has some very ancient uh, buildings along the edge. Yeah. The reason why it widens is because it, what they call a waste. Um, it, the, farm, the people who owned the land next to this old road in the <coughs> medieval times pulled oh their fences back from the road and allowed the people to graze their animals next to the road, a kind of uh, given, given away space to kind of public space of a cer certain kind of generosity to let people graze their animals um, here before bringing them into the city. And the result is that um, the road is still... Uh, wide today. Well, the proposal was very simple. Um, we, we wanted to in intensify this. They, they wanted to make a, this public space um, somehow re uh, renewed for the Olympic Games that are this summer. And uh, because this is, will be the, the route of the, um, of the marathon. Venice. Yeah. And so we proposed a simple th idea, which is to um, to just pave this whole surface with uh, one material. It's not paved, it's a uh, sand, it's a uh, gravel. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same as, <coughs> as uh, uh, in the like this. museum. Yeah, and like, like this here. This is in, in Bordeaux, yes. a kind of sandy surface where um, uh, it kind of unifies across and becomes the, the whole of this uh, widening space of, this, of the road is um, given one um, unity, something like that. And that's it. And there's a road next to it, yeah? I mean, the uh, road for the cars. With, they wouldn't let us, they wouldn't even think about <laughs> putting this surface on this stretch of the road. Yeah? But I think it's quite <coughs> generous already on the, us, on the other side. OK, and we're going to show you a, a few pictures of the Lichterfelder project because it's really a, the background to the, the future projects which were realized um, in Korea. In, may, in the late 90s, we entered a competition here in Berlin um, for Lichterfelder Sud, which is, this was the, the location of the Berlin Wall on the south side of, of Berlin. You know, it, it zigzags like this, it used to. And um, this area here from here and here and this area was the site. And distance between here and there is approximately a kilometer. So it's something like a kilometer square site, approximately. And um, the proposal was, at that time, the assumption was by the developers and the city um, of Berlin that when the people from Bonn come to Berlin, to, um, for the government people move, there's going to be need for a lot of house, new housing, 
Of course, it, there, it was untrue. It was never happened. They came, but there was not, no um, problem about the number of houses. But that was the assumption. So they made a large international competition to change this site, which, which has a very long and checkered, uh, uh, many types of history um, of use. Um, in the Second uh, World War, in the 20th century, it was a military, and after the Second World War, a military uh, site for the Russians and the American armies to, um, to do a kind of practice ground. That was a kind of war theater. Yeah, yeah there, where they had a little wall. <laughs> they had a little kind of pseudo Berlin wall, and they had a kind of uh, image of East Berlin and an image of West Berlin. On, image on of block. Yeah. yeah. And image of landscape city, yeah. And I think they were sort of sh shooting on either side of the wall or something. I don't know as practice, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, and in this, this is the S Bahn here going into Berlin, and um, outside here is Telto, which is former East Germany. And um, in the 1930s, there was a big railway works that was being built here, and. And in the 20s and 30s, and it, they, the, um, this, you can see that in the next slide. Oh, well. no, no, this no, is no, this no. is actually the no, uh, the landscape of. That's of, a that geological condition. It's very very flat. It was all under the sea, yeah, yeah. and that and as of time, yeah, which we want not to ignore. Can you yeah. put it back? No, not this one. The first one. Yeah. There is, uh, there is this, uh, as Phil said, this railway, sorry. This railway and this uh, factory for making railways in the 30s. And they built all the uh, Abstellgleise, yeah? the, the, the rails for store, for, for parking, uh, the carriages. They put them at rectangular. Uh, perpendicular to, uh, perpendicular the, to the main uh, line, yeah, and this has left in this in this uh, site left uh, these uh, rail tracks are not completely removed and they are still there. So um, this is we'll come back to the, the yeah, we'll come back time, to but, that. Um, this these lines are the former roads between farming fields in the 18th and 19th century. So the suburbs next to same it to also have this, this same structure. Uh, but these roads don't exist anymore. But we found this plan, which shows, and there's a, re there's a forest here. This is the structure of the land of the agricultural time. And here we have an aerial photo of the railway. So the railways that Florian was talking about, here you see that it turns right angles. And they were arranged east-west thereabouts um, across the they were just being built, actually. So, and this is there's some remains of it like that still today. This is another time. This is a time of um, post-military uh, time, when the site has not been, it's been sort of has a fence around it, still does. And the wilderness has come. So it's a kind of, you could call it an ecological time. And the ecologists have, this is a map given on the, in the competition for different areas of special ecological interest for different types of plants and grasses and different types of amphibians and so insects and so on. Particularly in this central zone here, there was interest and in this forest, forest zone. This kind of special grasses and so on. Out of all of, uh, out of those as uh, different times that are somehow embedded in the site, we came to a, what we call a landscape infrastructure plan, where we made, um, this is the, uh, the lines of the farming field lines of the roads, as you remember. These are the lines of the railway, the geometry of the railway. And you can see, you find that when you come to the site, you wonder why is that forest has this straight line edge? And it's in that direction, and similarly, at the bottom here, there's the forest ends with a straight line. And you see these long lines of in, in this sort of east-west direction. You think, now, what is going on? What, 
we couldn't understand it. And um, it's the structure that has come from that one time. It's somehow still there. And here is the um, ecological field here, like that. So we thought, OK, we take these different um, cultural landscapes, this, this kind of, um, these different orders that are embedded in the land, and we, make, we bring them together, and we make this field, building field plan, where, where it makes these um, building fields, we, we called them, of which there would be each one would have a, a neighborhood. And in between those fields, we made edges with different types of edges, with stone walls or tree lines and so on, ditches. It's something like that. This is in, in England, where the fields are uh, limit, delimited by hedge, hedges, hedgerows. But it's something like that, that, that the, the blocks of forest and the hedges are giving this landscape infrastructure. And into those um, building fields, we place, this is a kind of diagrammatic uh, uh, representation of uh, different types of what we call the won menu. Won menu. A, um, a different typologies or, or types of neighborhoods, of ty different types of buildings that would inhabit these um, different fields. But we knew that we wouldn't design all of these. There would be many architects in the future that would design it, and it would, might take 50 years for all of this to be built or half of it to be built. So it's, our, our, our role would be maybe to build one or two of these fields and design them, but the rest of them other people would do in their own way. So we, we, we were trying to think of, this is more like a kind of musical score where we, we make the lines on the score sheet and the other people do the music, uh, the musical notes. This is uh, one of these uh, building fields. And uh, we sort of <coughs> made some kind of uh, proposal uh, design. Uh, and we wanted it to you. We wanted it again, the spaces of this, of this neighborhood should be uh, Void spaces again, and uh, we uh, made a, a, a solid piece of plaster, and we cut into these plasters the empty spaces, uh, and this was a cut for the uh, road, and it's uh, or it's like more like a river, hmm? and. Uh, and then there are the gaps between the houses. Uh, and that uh, is a public realm for this particular field. Huh? And there is this, this, is, this was this one block of plaster. Huh? And the pl a plaster had a slope on the top. Huh? So all these uh, roofs are sort of sloping this way. Uh, and that's uh, a kind of a space. Uh, a Schließung, yeah? and uh, it's the most, it's a, the, the common space, uh, of course. This is another one, another type of walled um, courtyard houses that share, share courtyards, um, and something like this. So they were uh, about five or six different types um, that we were proposing as general types that other people might take up. And then we thought, well, OK, how could it, could it work that if you made the um, infrastructural lines, the edges of these fields, and if some, some of the fields started to get built and not other ones were not built, could it work? And we thought, yes, it could, that somehow with this um, type of strategy, if it's half built or a quarter built, it could also feel already finished. So it would never feel incomplete because the, the, the landscape infrastructure would already, already give the landscape a um, formation. This is a more complete plan um, of how one, it could be in a more complete state. Or like this, at the ecological field with little bridges going across. 
These are trees, uh, these are not wood of houses. But this is what really the infrastructure would look like without the buildings. It's, this is the rug without the picnic. Yeah. This is the, this is the um, space of the land given, given formation like, like Leverance did at Malmo, and there's not, without necessarily the, the, the graves in, in it. These are existing trees. Okay. So as a background to that, as that as a background, um, we were asked to, um, in the late 90s, just after that project, to, to make a plan for the urban and landscape uh, uh, design for a new um, publishing uh, uh, quarter in South Korea, just outside of Seoul, along the river. And that's what it looks like now on Google. Um, that's the phase one of Pajubuk City, and phase two is just now being planned north of it here. This is the Han River, a big river, um, bigger than the Thames in London, especially at this point. And it's going, flowing north and then west out into the Yellow Sea. Uh, and we're not far from the boundary. If you go further north here, you're not far from the boundary of South and North Korea. That is a, that's a hill, that's a mountain, yeah? And uh, if there is a mountain uh, on a site in Korea, then you have to be careful, hmm? because the mountain is a kind, it's like, a, uh, it's like the ancestors of the society. Yeah? And a mountain, uh, it's just, uh, People have a lot of respect, yeah? and so... It has a depth of meaning. It has a depth of meaning in Europe, of course, but... This was in important, the East, it's important, important, uh, uh, what is left over from the mountain. Yeah. This, is a, this line here is a, a, a dike, a, a raised dike about 8 or 10 meters off the wetland of the edge of the river that was built and has a motorway on it, and it, they call it the Freedom Highway. And it's because it is... It will connect South and North Korea once there is reunif reunification of the two countries. And the South Koreans are hoping that this happens as soon as possible. Wait so a minute. Don't do it away. Uh, uh, this uh, is a, it's a motorway, but it is in landscape uh, language. It's, uh, it's an embankment. It's a large embankment, eight meters high. It's a, la it's a kind of... Uh, artificial landscape thing. And uh, it creates the inside for the city and the outside for the city. And the outside for the city is quite, quite uh, dangerous for the city. And uh, this eight meter uh, embankment makes also a visibility uh, condition. Yeah? You, when you are next to the embankment, or when you're on this side of the embankment, you don't see out. Huh? You see to this, uh, uh, see to this edge. Huh? And uh, again, one can uh, make it very, uh, uh, we, we make it uh, in the landscape infrastructure quite a strong uh, feature, huh? this, this uh, planted wall. And as you can imagine, before they built this, which was only maybe 20 years ago, um, this wetland came all the way to the base of the mountain here, and all the way to this farm fields were all wetland uh, floodlands. So this has made a kind of flood defense barrier for the, and made this into a kind of new land. But um, when we came first there, in the late 90s, oh, this is <laughs> the bus that they have, has the plan on it. Um, when we came, it was like this. There's the mountain, and there's the motorway, and the, the river is further out here. And it was a, still a, a wetland that had been partially used by a kind of squatting farmers, sort of Ill, partially legal, partially illegal uh, farmers that were growing rice on, this, on little fields between these um, waterways. And we went up on the mountain, and it looked like that. Can you describe that, Florian? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a river, and <coughs> three kilometers of it, uh, and uh, there is a motorway, so it's an embankment, eight meters embankment, 
uh, 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 and this uh, is the building land, and the building land is very wet because there's a lot of water still in the ground. This water is being taken away partially by a kind of uh, what do you call it? a drain, really, a little river huh? that takes the water back to the water station and back into the river. So there is, it is another important element of the landscape infrastructure, this uh, draining river. Huh? Yes. And then there comes, this, thank you, another one. <laughs> another one. Yeah. Which one? Might write better. OK, thank you. So, uh, and that is the bottom of the mountain. I'm, we're standing a little bit up on the mountain. Uh, and the mountain uh, is sort of commanding the whole space for the city. And that's very important. You, people want to have a view of the mountain. And they want to have a view of the water, or at least this water. Water and mountain, views of that is, if you can create this as an architect for, uh, for Koreans, you have won their hearts. Yeah? It's important. And then uh, to make it dry, the land, yeah? you can build on columns, yeah? like well, it's been done in a lot of places, yeah? but it costs quite a lot of money. So they make rather prefer to build on fill land, yeah? on sort of gravel on top of the on top of the uh, plants, uh, putting this gravel. It's a bit uh, of a pity, to, uh, because most of this uh, will disappear. Yeah? But we have a, a, a client who is very, very sensitive about that, and he has saved a lot of the, uh, of the wild, uh, what you call it, What's wetland. wetland, yeah. wetland yeah? That's he, uh, it, it's his house where he used to live. And he brought it to the site as the first house on the site. And this is, oh, this is Mr. Yi. That's uh, chief of all the uh, public uh, pu publishing uh, companies. Uh, and he's a very sort of cultivated person. And he is producing, uh, he makes, uh, uh, the bookmaking is for him an art. Uh, and it's just, it's wonderful to have one of his books in your hands and read it. Uh, and he is sort of, when he goes through the wetland like this, he goes so careful like this, so as not to tread on too many plants. And uh, so this was our friend. Uh, and you know, the others have, in, 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 in uh, the one, uh, the project in Berlin, Anna, we didn't have anybody who was supportive like this to us uh, and respectful. Huh? Uh, so this is... <coughs> so the proposal was to try to retain as much of that wetland as we could, but also build a city. They wanted a book city, Paju book city. So we said, you can have an urban wetland. You can have a city and you can have the wetland. And it can be for books. It's a bit of a contradiction because books don't want to be wet. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we, we made a plan for how one could put fill, that fill on, the, on the ground, but not everywhere. And in the end, there's, there's, they've achieved quite a lot of um, retaining of, the, of this reed land. It's quite, it's quite impressive. That was a sketch. Uh, of uh, inhabitation of these uh, spaces. Uh, and uh, this was the, <coughs> uh, the, 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 these strips uh, are in response to the length of the river, in response to the, uh, to the embankment, uh, and response to the drain. Uh, and uh, they are sort of, it's a kind of a text, a text about the seat somebody, uh, next picture. Yes, this is uh, Paul Clay, yeah? Paul Clay is, I thought this is one of them. 
and he has sort of this is a he calls it a sh a sheet out of the book of cities. So uh, there is a horizon, and there are there is a city written into the into the page, and that fitted very well the sort of sp uh, for, uh, spatial conditions of the site. So we did this a little bit. So there are the uh, printing companies uh, at the edge and uh, next to the embankments, and they ha all have their own kind of maneuvering uh, courtyards. Uh, and this is what is called the bookmaker's street. That is where most of the bookmakers have a, uh, have a uh, what is it called? Is printing, the printing, publishing office. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and these are these. And uh, on the other side, there are more of these, uh, of these publi uh, or publicity places. But what we, what we did is we tried to, to make um, distinction between the different um, types of space in the site, the kind of different regions or, t or, or topographies or, or, or um, a kind of different landscapes within the landscape. And so as a response to the these buildings are the height of the motorway, eight meters high, not higher, so that the buildings on, in this row could look over them and see the mountains on the other side of the river. Because these are two, uh, two, stories. two stories, these ones, and the other ones are four stories, so they look over these ones. And then you can see that there's a type here that is these kind of free-shaped buildings. They, we call them wetland stones. They're in the wetland. And so there's a different type of building that has a, it's, so in, like Lichterfelde, like in the building fields, they had certain types of buildings. Here, it's developed to what we called uh, city structures. There, so the whole of this street is one city structure. The buildings are not all the same, but they have a similar formation that become one city structure together. I mean, this street, uh, well, book by the street, you will have, as we will see it in a minute, it is quite convincing as a city structure. And then there is another city structure there. And this was given by, the mountain had a, a military uh, uh, post on top for viewing the river, because they're worried about uh, North Koreans coming by river. And so they're, they're um, surveying it. And so th there's a height restriction given over this land. And in fact, even that direction was given from the station. So, so this is another little quarter. Um, which we thought was we would give very thin buildings and thin alleys like in Barceloneta in, uh, on the coast of Barcelona. So they each have a different um, structure. This is a different structure. This is a kind of spine uh, row which was not built and so on. So we started this is, to get this, is, uh, this, is, this is a very special building that is shared by all the company. But that's a distribution center. Huh? Uh, and everybody is working with these distribution systems. And this is a building that has a, a, an artificial topography. It's a ramp that is rising from yeah. there to there. And, oh, okay. right. sorry, go back. And uh, sort of, this is a kind of sloping, uh, uh, cake or, uh, in the landscape, in the wetland. Huh? And that is also built, but the slope is not enough. They have chickened out a bit. OK, we're going to talk a little bit then about, uh, um, we, we did had the opportunity to do a first building, which was a kind of <laughs> prototype of some of the urban ideas. That's, this is this building here. OK, that's for Mr. Yi and his publishing um, company. And then we did another building next door for another company. Actually, it's two buildings for the one company. And then the third piece on the same street is the um, sort of big book hall or, or book gallery for Mr. Yi. So, so there's three buildings and two different years of working on it. We developed um, uh, our, a number of ideas about these urban ideas that we just described, but at the building scale. So those are the three drawn together. 
you can see that there's a datum at second floor level here. That's a height of the embankment. Yeah. So the parts above that datum are smaller in density, and the part below is much higher in density and have small patios. So these parts can see out to the river and to the mountain and across the street between, in, it allows gaps for the neighbor to see it out through to the landscape at the upper levels. And at the lower levels, it's part of the world of the, um, of the wetland behind the dike. This is yeah, a demonstration. A this building was the first one. It's a demonstration of that principle. These are <coughs> little patios that are carved out of a, the bottom layer, the first two floors. And these are the smaller uh, parts of the building on the upper levels. So that was the first building in Paju. Huh? And it had, it's Mr. P uh, Yee's building. And it had to be giving, a, it's a demonstration building, what these buildings have to do in order to uh, 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 accept, uh, accommodate the landscape infrastructure. And uh, basically makes the sharing of space possible. Huh? So, uh, and then there is this sort of two-story space and connecting to the, uh, uh, to the streets. Uh, there are these courtyards that are two stories that connect to the street work. And then there are these pavilions of the horizon, we call them. And they are seeing, from there you can see out to the river uh, and to the land beyond. And, <coughs> and there's another one about this. I mean, that's not followed by the other. That's only for this one, I think. Uh, and conceptually, this is all one shape one black shape, conceptually. And again, what we are doing, we are just cutting away conceptually this piece, and we're cut, cutting this out, and we're cutting this away. So the, the void spaces, yeah, which are the interesting spaces for the uh, uh, life on, of, in, in this building, yeah, uh, they are these positively shaped void spaces. Now that is an artist who we also quite like. What's his name? Carl Andre. Carl it's very Andre. early kind of um, <coughs> experimental work. You know, Carl Andre is the uh, American artist that put um, mostly kind of horizontal sculptures that you walk on. Um, but in the early days, he was making these kind of cutaway forms in the same way that Florian was just describing. And these are some drawings. This is this entrance courtyard from one of our Korean collaborator who has very tragically died not long ago. I mean, it was extremely sad. And, and he has drawn, I mean, he could draw this uh, spaces and they were always ma magical because they were not so definitive. Uh, they had, they were kind of dreamy and foggy and, and that um, I think is very good. <coughs> the cutaway parts are made with this transparent um, polycarbonate and cast glass facade. Um, so, and the, the, what Florian described, the black part which is on the outside shape, is made with a timber rain screen. And that's uh, from the roof of the two-story uh, two part of the black building. And that's what you see when you are at that level. So from this, from this windows, you see incredibly the panorama of the big landscape. Over the roofs of the factory buildings here. And uh, so, this is the black building in there. And this is uh, another building, which has is two buildings, which we will explain in a, in a minute. This is uh, used to be the, was meant to be the police station, not designed by us, by Sung, who is the coordinator of the whole, architecture coordinator of the whole thing. Uh, and uh, at this, <coughs> And, uh, we have made the, pl the, the, the plan, urban landscape plan. So all the 
layout of the uh, of the sp main spaces here are upon us, and the main bookmaker street they makes a bend here and changes <coughs> direction, and the buildings need to follow this in some way. So we are lucky to be with our buildings that we were allowed to design exactly in this bend because this bend gave us the idea of making out of one building two buildings and makes a, uh, uh, the uh, makes a curve in the gap between the two buildings and where is this um, so, th so it, this building in the, the north building is lining up with the street and this is the original building we just showed you Mr. Yee's building and so that northern building is lining up with the bookmaker street and this southern building is turning itself not all the way to this angle but slight al almost all the way and it opens up this kind of charged void as Peter Smithson would call it I mean a kind of gap which is tight but uh, generous but tight and awkward and um, not so awkward like uh, um, uh, has a certain charged value and there's this gap you see and uh, the, this owner of this site, he, he wanted a one a building, but then we said to him, look, we have the idea of make two buildings for you. Uh, and uh, he said, yeah, but I have not only that much money. I said, yeah, we're not making it more bigger and more expensive. Uh, and we are making a space uh, that is a space that uh, kind of can be shared by the uh, people of Paju, and so this is kind of a present to the people of Paju's space. And when he heard this, that he can make a present to the Paju people, he was all for it. And this was absolutely moving. Okay. And then he said himself, ah, other people asked him, what are you going to do if somebody wants to run across in the big rain? Uh, from one side to the other. He says, I have a, a, a bucket of uh, umbrellas in this, uh, in this house and a bucket of umbrella in this house. And, that's how, and that's, it was done. Huh? And then we wanted to build this building because Mr. Uh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. Uh, he said, the owner said, I, I, like, uh, I like bricks. I can think in a brick environment. I can write in a brick environment. He really felt very deeply about having brick. Yeah. And uh, so we said, yeah, we make you the building all in brick, really big brick walls. Solid, can, solid. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then the uh, regulations in Korea changed of the earthquake resolution. Uh, there was uh, coming from uh, Japan a new regulations the, to Korea. And we couldn't do these uh, brick walls anymore. They wouldn't allow us uh, to have four-story brick walls. Uh, also, they were big enough uh, and thick enough. And no, no, no way. And then we said, OK, we'll have to use the cl uh, brick as cladding. But we don't want to use, uh, what are they called, ties. Yeah, you know, in Switzerland, everybody has it. And they have these ties. These ties are uh, ties, steel ties that are uh, securing the brick uh, cladding against a bigger wall behind the cladding. Yeah? And you don't see the ties. And it's something quite strange about a building with ties because you look at endless big uh, uh, elevations of brick and, uh, uh, and it, it just can't be. Yeah? And um, there must be these ties. Yeah? We don't like the ties because when they are rotting, you don't see that they are rotting. And then suddenly the brickwork falls off because the ties have been rotting and you didn't know about it. So we uh, use it like this. Yeah? This is an industrial building uh, uh, sort of discovered by the bakers. Bakers are as you know. Photographers, art photographers, and they have made it their business to look at industrial buildings in the 30s 
and they are and they found a lot of brick buildings and these brick buildings they have a a bit of a very light steel that holds the bricks back to the uh, main steel structure that they, uh, carries the roof and carries the floor that is and we thought that is much you know more understandable so we did it this way so there are these thing, these little things and they are every sort of 900 millimeters and they are not allowed i mean they are they are not we don't put them next to the window like this because we think that is sort of center window is imprisoned with our little steel ties so we let the steel ties just hit it there and then start a new one and uh, and that one is here uh, and uh, i think this looks much more uh, relaxed and uh, then we did something else because this client really wanted to do a building that is not just a sort of office but he wanted a building that can do also uh, living and uh, and uh, party and so we made him uh, uh, a plan of rooms we call it so there are this, this type of rooms uh, with two windows in it and two doors and this type of room uh, like that big room and this room different sizes different proportion rooms and you go from room to room and no corridors and uh, this makes kind of a more social space uh, that you also sometimes have to walk through a room uh, uh, to go to another room so you have to talk with the people and uh, this is uh, for inside you have the concrete yeah, in this building and some of these concrete we have given a very very fine clothes like a shirt a very nice shirt uh, uh, and, and that is uh, on a temple frame uh, and it shifts a little bit to the opening from the concrete. Yeah? So some, you see the concrete on one side, but not on the other side. So to make clear that this is just a curtain and not some kind of fixed wall. Well, it's difficult to see, but it's, the, it's covered with a very delicate um, rice paper, wallpaper, that they have in, as traditional um, houses in Korea. Um, and it, you can smell. You smell, when you come in the room, you can smell this paper. The smell of paper is one of the uh, what one Buildings of the houses is called the smell of paper. Yeah, and then there was another yeah, and th this Pachubuk City it's called Pachubuk City. Everybody knows what that is, but it's not really city because uh, because the buildings still look quite a lot like a, a publishing office uh, and there is not enough living spaces i mean now the government has agreed uh, that the top floors of the four-story buildings can be uh, declared to be houses and flats and so now at least some people now, and in, in one area of Spadio Book City, there are more uh, uh, houses possible. So we are beginning to, I mean, they have very rough, uh, tough zoning regulations in Korea, and uh, uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, make this a bit more relaxed. Uh, but time in time, things are changing. and. So, abscesses are Mr. Yi, Mr. Yi asked us to do, an ex there's the black building here on the left, uh, and he asked us to make an extension of that black building, and originally we had made a proposal in the, initially to, to, to make this black building cover his whole site. So it had a number of those pavilions at the top, and so on. it was a kind of the same, the black building going longer, and... Um, and the assumption was that we were going to just build that second stage of his building. But the program was different, and 
that we had now had this intention to think about Padre Book City more like a city and make a building which had more what the English call civility, a kind of more civilized building, a building that had a kind of um, character of its own that is not quite as abstract as the black one is, has a kind of, of um, presence of like a, like a person or like a figure. And, um, and he also wanted this building to be a public, uh, have a public uses. The first um, two, the, up to this level, is uh, the, behind here is a, a large book hall, he calls it. A big um, kind of library or bookshop or book gallery. And, and he wanted it to be like a kind of church inside there. I mean, that kind of feeling of a big uh, hall space. And there's a cafe here on the ground floor. And at the back, we will see in the plan, is a, is a, is a book um, uh, a room, a, a tall room, a kind of cubic room for, for rare books that he has as a collection. And up, up above here is two floors of apartments. Just hit that. So, yeah, and so, so, so this has a quite a different um, uh, uh, conception by, from the client and from ourselves than the black building had. It's a more city building. More city building. That's what Mr. Yee said. Can you have, have a, a, a city building? Which, to justify this word city in the name of Paju. Yeah? And so he was quite for this. And so we, say, we think something like this is a city building. Huh? Yeah. And uh, this is a sort of special occasion, and people are gathering in the space, in the square, and people are looking out of the windows everywhere into the... Into the. This is city building for us. And uh, so we are... So, uh, I mean, we're also very sort of curious about there's a relationship between the opening and the human figure, yeah? Uh, and everywhere is uh, people in these windows looking out. Yeah? Uh, so... And it's also very interesting, this is a Renaissance painting from Venice, so it's a little um, square in Venice, still exists, and each building is a different character. There's two really thin characters, there's a sort of main uh, character on the square. The church is to the right here, very big um, presence. They each have a different um, kind of uh, gesture and a different personality. And so not only are, they, are each of the windows and um, arrangement of windows in the building have different personalities, but the buildings themselves are like characters on the square. So we have said, said he said, I want uh, to, this to be a, a bit like a village, this building. And uh, so we said, you can't have a village because your site is not big enough. Actually, I think we have that like this. So that's, that's his ancestor's house. Uh, not house, really. I mean, village. And he said, I want that. But that was unreal. So we said, let's see. Uh, so we said, okay, maybe we can stack things on top of it, uh, each other, houses on top of each other. So that's a vertical one, not using a lot of footprint. And there, uh, then there is uh, uh, this here is uh, the uh, space for the staircase and some space for uh, a working room. Uh, and this is this, the space for the uh, book hall. Uh, and we have given sort of articulation to this, and we call this kind of houses, stacking houses on top of each other. So, uh, next. And this is a, a little um, figure in front. Yes. So. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, let's go. F this is a, bo a book hall. It's the most important ro uh, room in the whole of Pachu. Huh? 
these are the uh, these are the built uh, the flats and the roof uh, patio the two story houses and two, this is two two story houses on this top. is a little sort of uh, a child that is sort of a bit itchy and edgy yeah, and doesn't quite do what one expected to do and we're looking at, through this section at this wall um, the, the wall of on the side of the book hall is a concrete um, in situ cast concrete wall which has a um, gallery at the top and it's like a, a house inside so this is there, this uh, figure in here is like a house or a building inside of the of the building that this was the little um, figure in the front and Mr. Yi calls this the art yard. He wanted, he wanted this space um, for occasions when there are openings and um, events. Again, a kind of gift to the city like, like we did for the other client. He wanted, this, he wanted the building to be set back and give a, a space, a public space. Of, for, and it would be of the similar size to the book hall. Yeah, and this, uh, this part is sort of one important uh, 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 block inside the building, and that's the book hall, and that's the uh, uh, reading room, and that's uh, the cafe. So they're going around the big, around this internal house. There you can see this internal house, the facade of that that we were looking at in the section, and the double story book hall as they were just putting the books in when this picture was taken. And you're up in the uh, mezzanine level of this house in the house, and the, looking out of these windows to the book hall. And that's the reading room, a kind of cubic, tall cubic space that looks out of these windows towards the first building, a patio towards the first building. And even the book, um, bookshelves were, um, we had a long discussion with the client about not making the bookshelves just go wall to wall and floor to ceiling. They wanted as many as they could have. They have a lot of books. And, and we said, no, you should make them as separate cabinets that stand. Uh, you can't see it on this picture. They stand on legs off the floor. And they have a kind of um, cornice or a hat. And they stand like figures, each of them. Um, and they have different proportions. They're not all the same. So even the bookshelf carries carrying through this idea of a kind of figurative presence in the building. That's the little um, portico. That's the main entrance underneath the portico. And inside is a one room with these windows down at the floor, where and that's the art yard, where um, you can have tea with Mr. Yi. <laughs> and you sit on the floor, and it's a it's a uh, paper. Korean paper floor and paper walls, and the floor is heated. And you look out of this window to the public space, to the square. It's really, really wonderful. You're in this kind of very domestic, kind of ancient space, and um, you're looking out to the public through this <coughs> window. It's a bit like that. This is in the south of France in the 19th century. So that's what we call civility. The building has a very um, calm, but um, uh, gentle, but um, sure presence in the public space. It gives this little sp public space some kind of dignity. And we're going to talk a little bit about the articulation of this facade. So it's just uh, what you call that relief, yeah, relief. Different planes in the in the cast concrete in the wall. Yeah, something like this. This is a, a 18th century stone building in um, south of France, in near Bordeaux. And what's particularly, I think, fascinating about this is. Um, I don't know how they did it. Maybe they, they built the house out of stone and then carved the relief, perhaps. Or maybe they did it um, uh, stone by stone. I don't know. But somehow, one stone has both the 
um, molding for the window and the molding for the wall. It's, it's like it's cast. It's out of one material, this, um, uh, this articulation is carved out of, out, like out of one piece. And it's just very, ju very, very light, this relief. It's not very heavy and, and fleshy. Not very fleshy, yeah. It's, more, it's, a, it's a bit more flat, almost two-dimensional. And we call it a kind of uh, a drawing uh, of a uh, uh, articulation, a drawing. Uh, I mean, it's almost not three-dimensional. Like the idea of drawing. Okay, so we'll go on to the larger urban project um, we did a few years ago, um, which you can see in the book that Florian <coughs> Riegler um, showed you at the, in the introduction. Um, this is on the southwest coast of South Korea. So this is the Yellow Sea, and it, we're looking west towards China, the, towards northeast China. And the Yellow Sea is um, a quite a high tide, it's, it's got something like a 13 meter tide, it's a difference, and, um, and there are two large rivers here and here that we're coming into the sea and there's another river up there and a, re a region of mountains to the south and a large flat area, a, re a whole uh, province of farmland, of flat farmland, which is very, very uh, unusual for Korea. Korea is a mountainous peninsula and so this has always been the breadbasket, or the, we would call it the breadbasket, the rice growing and vegetable growing, the food growing part of uh, South Korea. And so it, was, it has always in the history been very rich. Um, but in recent times, as is the case in most parts of the world, agriculture is not really that uh, profitable and everybody is becoming industrial and going to the city and this region has become not very economically very um, uh, um, uh, rich. Right. And um, in the early 1990s, Korea became a democracy. Previous to that, there was a military government, and they became democratic in the early 90s. And the, the promise by the politician that got in the first president is that he was going to make this seawall, and they were going to reclaim land here and make more farmland with the understanding that in the future there will be a, a food shortage in the world and they're going to need this extra land. And they, they will do this in several places along the coast. And he promised this and the, and the people in, the, in this region came to him seven years later and said, well, what happened to this promise? I mean, you, you, you know, you, we, we voted you in and where's the promise? And they started building the wall and it took 15 years. From, it took, took from early 90s until uh, 2007 to complete, um, and it's a huge. It's a 34-kilometer-long wall from here to here. It's the longest one in the longest sea wall in the world. Um, some several kilometers longer than than the really large one in the ne Netherlands. And it's very, very expensive, billions of uh, dollars. Um, uh, and when you go there, it looks like that. It's um, infinite. It looks infinite. It looks like you, well, it just goes off. It goes into the clouds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's, you can't tell whether that's the Yellow Sea. I mean, maybe that's some land there, and so we're looking inland, or that's the sea, and that's the lake. It's hard to know. It's really vast, because if you imagine, it's, if that's 34 kilometers long, um, this is something like 400 square kilometers. Huh? Yeah. The, the, the area of the lake. Okay, so the project was to, um, they've built the wall, and there's this shallow lake here, and these rivers are still flowing in, and they can control the lake level inside here with some dams, so some gates here and here. So when the tide goes out, they can let water out, and when the tide comes in, they can close the gates, and they, this lake can be at a level below mean tide level or they can put it where they want it, you know? And they want to then make new land in here, but not only for farming, but for a new city. And our project 
was what sort of new city? It's really, really a beautiful place. Um, this is the islands that are, Archipelago. are out here. Okay. They're really, really spectacularly beautiful. And um, the place has a lot of history. You can just feel it. And uh, fishing history and farming history, and, and it's embedded in the place. And you, you, can't, you can't start working there as if it's a tabula rasa. It I might come further, Pete. So change the, change the tape. Okay, we'll just change the tape. Um, yeah, this is. Um, this is a very good uh, photographer. His name is Wang. So the connection between the land and the people, it's the same in all parts of the world in different ways, but in, in the Far East and particularly in Korea, it's a very close connection. Florian described it with the mount how the mountains are sort of treated like some kind of ancestors or deep meaning. Uh, the, but also it's because they're agricultural people, I suppose, that there's a very close connection with the land. And the, the land has a lot of meaning. And it somehow is, uh, you can see that in that photograph. So the site has a lot of time. This is a, a 19th century uh, map. map of a partial map of the, 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 they map the whole of Korea like this, where the two, these are the two rivers here, and this is the archipelago, and <clears throat> these are different place names. And this is a, 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 a plan which shows reclamations, history of re reclamation. Here you can see in 1924, that piece of land was reclaimed. So the, wall, the edge of the water was there before that um, in 1951 and so on. It went, goes right back to some, the beginning of the 20th century. And in 2008, when we were working on it, already some uh, land is, is coming out. Some islands are coming out by themselves because they've lowered the water level. And you can see these are the topography lines under the water um, where it's deep, very deep here and where the river is coming. Um, and uh, it's very interesting uh, what they don't take away. Huh? Uh, these are rocks, huh? and these are rocks. And these rocks, uh, they are, again, you know, very important ideas, markers in the landscape. Uh, and uh, say, uh, I mean, this, these mountains and rocks are under uh, threat because when they want to build uh, islands, uh, they want to uh, take them, take these uh, these mountains out and put them somewhere into the water. But so far, they have not done this, and uh, and we have always emphasized: please don't do this. And uh, you, have to maybe. Also imagine, you have to imagine that there used to be islands before that was reclaimed. That was an island. Yeah, this was an island. And so now they are kind of land islands. But they, and this, um, for example, that wall there used to be the sea wall, the, the edge of the sea. And so there would be an embankment there that's a kind of, well, you could call it a time witness. I mean, it, it, it's in the landscape as not being used for its former use. Um, but it's very interesting to see these um, remnants of, of past. So that's what it looks like when we... And the water visit. goes away. Yeah. And you're looking at the bottom of the sea. This is quite an experience. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the artificial and the natural. This is a, um, something to work with. This is, uh, here we're looking at Alvaro Cesar's plan for Macau, the extension of the city of Macau, the island of Macau. Uh, it was an unrealized um, project. And this was for us a, a kind of a touchstone, a, a very, very um, wonderful way of thinking about how to make new land. Um, what he's done is he's, he's put new islands separated from the original natural island with a body of water in between. 
different size body of, bodies of water. So the gap between the new island and the old island is the project. That's the space of the city, is these new uh, kind of bodies of water. Voids. Yeah, they're kind of uh, uh, in between space. And, and the artificial is artificial geometry. Huh? And the natural is the natural, right? And there's a conversation, yeah? This is becoming much stronger because that is opposite it and as a way around. And, the, and the artificial, he's generating this grid from a kind of dimensions that he's measured from the block plan um, in Chinese cities. So, and he measured and, and the street width and so on. And so these have slightly different uh, geometries, each of these islands, as a kind of principle for generating this um, new islands. Well, that's what he does when he's doing it at the building scale, the, the play between the artificial and the natural. Um, it's making um, the two, uh, the artificial and the natural, live uh, off of the other. A kind of a take advantage that the, the rock becomes more rocky by the actual by this straight edge and the gap between, and the straight edge becomes more artificial and um, beautiful because the rock is there. And, and the play between these things, I think, is very poetic. Very. very this is architecture. OK, coexistence. Coexistence. Um, we, don't like, we don't like zoned cities. Huh? And we, this, was, this is the most difficult uh, idea to get that through. And challenge. It was a real challenge. It's a real challenge. Yeah. So uh, at Paju, we had that problem that Florian yeah. explained that it was, it's zoned as an industrial estate, Paju. And very difficult to get any other uses, houses or, or commercial uses or whatever, other uses. Um, schools, it doesn't, it, it's, it's the, the planners have this sort of narrow-minded view that it, it, that's industrial. Yeah? You can't even really, you're not really even allowed to have a bookshop there. Yeah? Um, and so we thought that's the biggest challenge, um, to have a new city that's designed from the beginning without functional zones. Um, this is the old European city. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, this is a, this is we're a, not going to give that up yet. So this is a kind of montage description of that, where on the farm, there's tourists. That's something that's happening all around the world. But it's a combination of two, um, two quite diverse uses that can be, take advantage of each other. The farmers can take advantage of the tourists, and the tourists can, can enjoy the farm. Or here at Schiphol Airport outside of Amsterdam, there's the runway. The fields um, next to the runway are growing tulips, and the tulips are being put onto the plane and, sh and flown to um, another city on the, within a few hours. So the proximity of the, of the farming and the airport is vital for those flowers to get there fresh. You know? So it's, there's something quite unique about a, a, a proximity of quite different uh, programs um, taking advantage of each other. Continuity or civility. So we wanted, uh, before thinking about the city plan for the new city, we thought, <coughs> Public space. I mean, one has to. How does one design good public space um, when you're designing a new city? No, no. no so uh, here we have the old plan, uh, Noli plan in, of Rome. We you know the Noli plan of Rome. Huh? Most of you know Noli plan of. Yeah. So it's that's a, it's a, a plateau here for public space. Yeah. It shows and we, you know, in, in little ways, we have uh, made these uh, discussions and won the discussions with this idea about the gift for the city. No? But uh, it's a long way to go. But what this is, I mean, you, the unique thing about this representation of, of Rome um, is that he's, he's drawing the inside spaces of buildings that are publicly accessible and the streets and the squares 
in the same way. So the network of public spaces, small and large, is what the drawing is about. I think that's a, it was a kind of turn, turnaround for, um, uh, for European culture to see the city like that. Turning point. Oh, that's kind so of like the water is the void. Yeah. <coughs> In Venice. Venice. In London, we have a wonderful example of a, uh, a building designed by Allison and Peter Smithson in the early 60s, the Economist building, where they, they demonstrated the possibility of making a small gift by just ha making three urban figures, the buildings for one client divided up into three different uh, sized buildings, and the space they made in, within the site between these buildings is absolutely it's wonderful. It's a passage yeah. from one street, very important little street in London, to the other one. And uh, you coming across on this podium, uh, you come across this uh, uh, building that is not one building, it's three buildings, and they are all buildings like in uh, Morandi's uh, paintings. Okay, now, we're in a, we, we, we know that we're going to make a city of islands. How can we make the experience of being on the island um, enjoyable and understandable? So the way that you make this landfilling is in this procedure like this. You make these kind of um, little uh, embankments. embankments, and you enclose a body of water, and then you either pump the water out or fill it up with, um, with landfill. They get the landfill from the bottom of the sea. And, or the second uh, sort of major method of doing oh, it is, together. Hmm. Yeah, is to lower the lake level, and up comes this bottom of the sea. We're looking at from the edge of the, what used to be this edge of the sea here, embankment, out to a huge territory that has already um, become land. And hey, you, have to to go, the, yeah. you have to go out there. This is fantastic to walk on the bottom of the sea. And they are trying all sorts of things out. Uh, you know, how can they desalinate the, uh, the ground? They have to do this. It takes 10 years. Yeah? And how, what, what can grow on the, on, the, on the ground and what can't grow? Uh, and uh, they make kind of fields and testing this out. So uh, it's, it's very interesting. OK, this is a diagram that we were given. Um, <coughs> that's the, the, the seawall very high and very, very, uh, because yeah. you can imagine, this is not a, a scale section. It's, 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 it's probably much more sort of it's pyramidal. It's a level. Yeah. It's giving you the different levels. This is the difference of level of high, t high tide to low tide outside of the seawall in the Yellow Sea, in this mean tide. And this is the proposal for <coughs> bringing the lake level down below 1.5 meters below the mean sea level. So that's a way of regaining land easily. That's minus 1.5. Yeah, from mean sea level. That's how they have already done that now. Um, and then this is a little mini embankment wall that you have to build around the islands. So in case of the flood of an of a event where this lake floods, you need um, some extra height along the edge. And this is the level of the land within an island. OK, so that's a kind of a diagram of. Yeah, that's reclaimed land behind the uh, embankment for the island. Yeah, that's an island here. Huh? Yeah. This is reclaimed, that's emerging, comes out higher than, uh, than the water, and uh, that's new landfill. Huh? And I get this from the bottom of the sea outside. Hmm. So that's um, actually doing that procedure of making the land not far from the site, just north of the site, they were already doing that. Here, and you can see there's a kind of landlocked island there. And the size of this place is so large that it took us months to understand the scale of this place. And we had to do things like, uh, you know, uh, we know a certain situation about the sea and islands and uh, distances from going on holidays, and we went to these places and to our slide collections and 
trying to find the direct experience. How, uh, how much do you see if you have this distance between that edge and this edge? So this way we kind of learned a little bit more how, how large things are. They are very, very large. So yeah. for example, this is looking from the city of Cadiz, Cadiz in south of Spain across the harbor to, to the uh, mainland. So it's like this. This is Cadiz. This is the city of Cadiz. It sits on this um, land out in the sea. And you, we're looking across that body of water. And this is the, s the same scale, this aerial photo, to the plan of the site. And so that body of water is something like, well, there's an early kind of diagrammatic plan of, say, going looking across there, or say, looking across here. And so we're trying to get a sense of relative scale of, from our own experience. It's the only way one can work um, from your, one's own understanding of, of distance and, 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 uh, and scale. And then we made first uh, uh, sketches of islands. And most important, we, uh, we discussed this with many people in Korea, many, uh, was island experience, meaning you should be able by walking to get from one water edge to another water edge. In about 20 minutes or 30 minutes, we thought. We, th we thought that would be something where you know that you're on an island and you, after 20 minutes you'll find the other side of the island. Yeah? In, in Venice, it's something like that. So we made this kind of long and thin islands. Huh? As, uh, a, as a first approach. It was sort of first idea. There you have them. And uh, that was sort of uh, 20 minutes to go across half of an island. And then we put another water body, an internal water body, into this kind of long re rectangular building. So. You come from the water and you meet an internal water, and then you go to the other edge of the big water. Uh, so uh, that was a uh, sort of a development of the Long Islands. Well, we were working on this without knowing exactly the topography of the lake bed. They hadn't given us that That's information. It. And so we were still um, very much working in the abstract realm. And when, once we got the. Um, well, this is the result. But you need to know the depth yeah. of the water, because if you are trying to make an island in deep, wa deep water, you're using a lot of film material. Huh? And so we, could, we had to give, we, we'd be given this topography then, halfway through the project. And then our islands looked like this, more uh, compact in places where, and, uh, where, where, where you have shallow water anyway. And for example, that's very deep there, very deep sort of hole. Very deep, yeah. uh, 26 deep meters there. deep. <coughs> so that was sort of a compromise, knowing about straightness of edges. Yes, there are all straight edges, but they are not rectangular anymore. Uh, and uh, there, are, uh, there are internal water bodies uh, to have the uh, water experience, and, uh, but they were more compact, uh, the, the islands. But this one was sort of the compromise that we said. We still had this idea of one long, thin island co connecting this to there. And we wanted the islands that, at the, that formed a kind of uh, auditorium yeah, uh, to look out uh, to the Archipelago. To the archip archipelago. Okay, so this, is a, this plan is a plan of the islands, the new islands. There's no city yet. It's, so we, that's how we worked. We worked with the, we called it the landscape infrastructure of islands. <coughs> so when we talked about the infrastructure in Lichterfelde, it was the edges of the field follow, following from the existing structure that was in the land. Here it's the same procedure, but um, it's making these islands according to the topography mm -hmm. and um, experience. Um, and for example, that is one of the little mountains, one of the little rocks there. And we, we kept a gap. Uh, we kept the new island away from, so, so a little bit of water between, like we saw in Avaro Caesar, you remember. Or similarly, there is a row, I can't quite see it. On, 
there's a row of rocks there. We kept this with a gap away from it. We didn't put new land up against these old rocks. All these islands kept always a bit of distance from the existing mainland. And then once we had this um, island plan, then we started thinking, now, what sort of city are we going to put on it? But only then, not, not sort of the other way around. And how do you inhabit these islands? We thought about the idea of city structures as we introduced it in Paju. And this is a, a project of, by RAP and RAP architects in, near Delft in, in um, it's a place called Ippenberg in Netherlands, uh, where they made a, a project of a certain type of buildings with these little towers and courtyard and streets that the whole um, district is one city structure, has a presence in the landscape like a, like a landscape feature, yeah? An art of, like one artificial um, uh, topography or territory of, uh, have, has its own quality and, uh, and faces this water um, uh, as, as one. Next yeah? second. And it looks like that in the street. So that's a sit what's what we call a city structure. It's something which is more than one building, but the, all the buildings have a similar kind of um, spatial nature. They're not all the same necessarily, but they have a spatial typology. So we started looking around for existing examples in cities that we knew of city structures that could um, have good public space in them. This is in London, and um, here we have a block, a city block. There's another city block here. Actually, that's one divided by the street across, the city block here. And this city block has big streets with large houses that's Harley Street, and this is Portland Place. And these have five or six story houses on the streets. And inside the block, they have these little lanes. That we, the English call them mews. And they are two story buildings inside the block that were built as coach houses and, um, for the horses and, and stables when, when these blocks were built. They have proved to be really adaptable to a lot of uses, these, this typology. Uh, they look like that in the news. Now there are, uh, of course, no horses anymore, and people are using these as houses or as little factories or as little um, schools and wor workshops and so on. Or that's a kind of sketch of it, the houses on the street and the kind of village of smaller buildings and smaller streets inside the block. So when, the, uh, when we did this uh, collaging of uh, city structures onto the uh, islands, the Korean uh, sort of observation party arrived. They traveled around to all the teams. And they arrived and said, well, how is it going with your inhabitation of city structures? So we took them to these places. And we explained these places. And they said, that's fine. They really liked this idea of the mini block without, in, within the big one. Of course, that would have to be, and they, they made this point themselves. You, ha you can't just take this and say, OK, we'll just use that and put that in like that. You, you have to translate or adjust. For example, the, the, the climate in Korea is similar to the United Kingdom, but it's not the same. The summers are different. Um, and so there would be an adaptation, but the, but the spatial arrangement, this, this kind of spatial idea could be utilized and re, re, reappropriated. There's another very different type. It's um, uh, Fisker in Copenhagen in 1920s, early 20s, where he's making a periphery block of, of apartments. That's the shape of the, of the block. And he makes a certain thickness of, of a five-story building. And inside the block is a large shared public garden. I mean, now in Berlin, you have this. It's quite common, but it was in the 20s after this was built. Bruno Taut and many others have um, made these large shared um, um, gardens. gardens. Um, but this was for the Danish at that time 
a kind of revolutionary, really, um, because they, it was a, you know in those days when nobody had bathrooms in the in the apartment, and this was a kind of um, they didn't uh, and and gas and electricity. This was a, this is something really unique, and now it still is, because it's near the center of the city, and you have this public realm in the block that um, people really, really appreciate. And it's beautifully made building, um, beautifully proportioned. It's a sort of moderate class, <laughs> classical uh, design. OK, this is a, another example, a Korean uh, contemporary example of uh, each building is on a very small plot, like a house size plot in a kind of grid, but they're four or five story buildings or six story buildings. So they're quite, it's kind of, and they're separated from each other, but they have an order and then they have some bigger public spaces cut out, cut out, of, the, um, out of the plan. And of course, um, that's a very well known example of Cerda in the 19th century in Barcelona. Uh, he was an engineer, but he, he designed this grid plan um, which has now proven again, like the, the London plan that we saw, to be highly, it was built as mostly residential, and, but is now highly adaptable to all sorts of uses. This is a study that has been done of the end of the diagonal where it comes to the sea and the district uh, has all these different programs um, embedded in the fabric of the Cerda grid. So we, there was about 10 or 12 of these examples that we collected and then um, arranged them onto the islands like a collage, like making a paper collage um, composition. Each of, the, each of the city structures has good uh, public spaces in, 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 in the city structure, but you can also make good public spaces between the different types yeah, by the way that you're composing them together. And so this is a kind of a, a view of what it might look like with these embedded onto the islands. I like that. And you can see that we've... we've on this island, it's the kind of the most important island. It's where the, all the harbors are and the, and the industrial harbor that, that was necessary for the city. And on the front edges of these islands, overlooking the, this big body of water and across the islands, looking west, is the highest density. It's where the concentration is. We've put the concentration. That's where the good view is. And or here, there's another concentration. Oh, this. Where there's a view of these little mountains and the river. <coughs> Here's another little kind of mini city um, where there's a river coming down from the mountains through it. There is a kind of a policy about magnets. And uh, magnets means that we want to maintain, that's uh, quite possible with an island city, uh, to to make a clear differentiation between what is inhabitation and what is uh, the inside and the, what is the outside. Outside is water. Uh, not here, there's no water here, but one would have to make a planning permission that this, we want to uh, really avoid spoil, uh, sprawl. sprawl huh? we, we really think sprawl is a it's the worst what can happen to a city. No? And uh, I think that's a very, very big question and very big task. And I think architectural sh uh, schools need to ask this question. What to, uh, happens about sprawl? We're looking a bit closer, that's the, what we call the harbor city. And you can see, for example, that's something like the Serda grid, although it doesn't have the diagonal corners. And these are, this is another typology. This is uh, something like Barceloneta here. Um, and so on, this is the Fisker blocks here. And so on. It's a, it's a, it's a collage of, of these different structures um, next to each other and um, uh, uh, colliding with each other. But the Sada grid can cope with it. Something like that. 
this is a collage of George Brack. Huh? And you know, in a, in, a, in a paper collage, the interesting thing is, is that that piece of newspaper and that piece of wood, um, by coming one on top of the other, somehow makes each, each <coughs> other a little bit more legible. Yeah? Um, the, the place where the, the one piece comes from and where the other piece comes from somehow becomes more um, understandable. In the, in the architecture skill, one can work with collage of um, construction. This is Jan de Wilder <coughs> in Ghent in Belgium. And he's, he's using a kind of a collage of ready-made elements freely, quite freely, I think, in, and uh, quite imaginatively, to make an architecture um, uh, that also fits into a kind of situation which is uh, diverse as well. OK, programs. So after all that, then we start thinking that the programs come after all the rest of what we just spoke of. And the main program is food um, in that region. And it's really, really good, the food. <laughs> it's, um, it's wonderful. Uh, and they want a whole industry of food, not just production of food, but distribution and packaging and research and so on. And so um, that was the main program. And they had a number of different programs they gave us. And our proposal, or we don't have the plan, is to, as we said, no zones, no, no functional zones. So really, we tried to draw a plan of the city with the functions somehow colored. We had sort of six leading programs. And we tried to uh, do it with, uh, with these six leading programs. But it's almost impossible to draw because it, you know this. You know, each exactly. building might have a number of. That's just the point. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can't draw that in a plan you, yeah. because it's not just on one level. It, it, it has to go ex, in extremely complex ways yeah, to have this. Uh, uh, used, used uh, represented. Yes. And then magnets, as we described. So here is a. Uh, Google aerial photo of um, part of the Alsace region. Um, so this is a, a wine village, and this is another one. And because this um, vineyards are so valuable, valuable for the economy, yeah, the the villages do not start building new houses in the between them. So that's the sea, yeah, in in, uh, in our in our city in our. Island city, that's the, the wine is here to see. Yeah? It's not just economy, it's culture. Yeah? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and they don't let their things become spoily. Yeah? Uh, these village are, villages are uh, reasonably contained yeah? because they have, because the, there is the wine. Yeah? That's a medieval version of, of that. Well, this is Montpazé in south of France, it's a Bastide town where. Uh, it's a grid town that was built by an English king, and um, they have very good public space in, these, um, in this town, and um, clear demarcation. It's getting a little bit blurred on this end, outside of this photograph, but where the landscape begins and the city stops. So that's what we thought. The water can do that, but also... Um, we want to delimit <coughs> the density. OK. Um, last little project. Um, a, little, a, a small thing that we uh, built last year and um, for, the, for a design biennale in Korea, um, in a place where um, there's a very important political event that had happened in 1980. Um, I described that in Korea they, they, used, they had a military government up until um, into the 80s and a, a kind of um, autocratic military government. And the people were getting angry. They had had enough. 
And the students in this city of Guangzhou, it's called, were protesting. And they were protesting in Seoul and other cities. And it got to the point where the protests were getting so um, intense that the government sent the army to this city with the command to shoot. And they, they shot more than 200 people um, in one day. And I think the people say it was more like 800 or 900 people probably, but the official figure. And so there was an event where um, a kind of turning point in the South Korean history where as a result of this massacre, it, after some years later, there was democracy in South Korea. And the people in the town are very, in the city, are very um, proud, sort of sad and proud that um, it was important, that, that event was um, somehow important to the history of, of the democratic times in their country. Um, so the city is a provincial city with, um, where along this side of the street is the, where there used to be a city wall around the, uh, an, it's an ancient city from uh, 500 BC it started. And um, the wall was taken down at the beginning of the 20th century. And the proposal for the, for the Biennale was to build a number of 10 what they called urban follies, a kind of public um, structures that um, would mark where the wall used to be, but not to build a wall. And we were given this site along this street. Um, and that glass building here is the site of what used to be the, news, the, the media building, the television media building. And in those protest times, the public burnt it down because they were not um, putting into the news the protests. They were not being allowed to. And the, this building was burnt down, and it's, so this is a rebuilding of the building. And that stone there is a monument to that place, to this event that the building was burnt down by the people. And that was our site along this about 50 meter long stretch of that pavement. On this side is a, a large girls school, a high school. And so there's the monument here and that's the glass building. And the glass building is set back a little bit from the pavement and has this kind of stage-like um, timber stage. But our site was actually from, from that line to that line, <laughs> this sort of little strip where the trees are. And, but about 50 meters long. Florian? Yeah, okay, we are we're supposed to sort of uh, uh, design a kind of generator, little generator of a uh, bit of public life. Uh, and <clears throat> so there, were, there was also an other memory in the site, the memory of a gate in the wall and the memory was sort of celebrated in a kind of a tablet, a stone tablet in, on the ground. So, and uh, that was, that was uh, uh, the big uh, glass building. So our memory pavement goes really from, from here to here. And uh, memory pavement was a, a word for our little uh, public life generator. And we thought, yeah, it should be, because the site was so narrow, we thought it should go up, uh, and it should become a little kind of uh, uh, public performance uh, stage. Uh, uh, so, and we looked also at sort of uh, precedents. Uh, this is in Italy, in what is the it's, a, it's, a, it's in Pompeii, yeah. and this is, this is a painting on the wall of an of a ancient Roman house in Pompeii, and they call this an edicule. It's a kind of fantasy architecture um, at, at the top of the wall, where you're looking up into the sky, and these buildings are almost so thin and so um, fantastical that you couldn't be built. You know? A kind of um, dream architecture, but very, very um, wonderful. Right. So <clears throat> there was a base, we made a base. Uh, we gave this uh, 
memory stone uh, a new house uh, in this space to bring it sort of more uh, to the level uh, of people in the, uh, passing on the pavement, sort of making better, can make better contact with this thing. This is a kind of seating, looking at the, waiting for the bus. Uh, <coughs> this is, a, that's a, there's a little kind of performance stage so, to make a kind of Little, uh, mu we had, there were some musicians there, and uh, uh, we will see what happens. And uh, that happens on this level. And on that level is a light, uh, because uh, this has to see, uh, show itself in the street. So in the evening, there's a strong light up there, and that's a sort of house for the birds. There are lots of magpies in this area. And the magpies, uh, they are sort of interested in uh, with people. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, and uh, uh, we sort of thought about a little uh, tectonic uh, uh, idea, concept. So there are these things in it that have rigid corners. And there is another one, a smaller one with rigid corners. And these rigid corners, Things they are in all four planes in different proportions and different form around this tower, uh, and next giving rigidity. Giving rigidity. So <coughs> there you have it. <coughs> next, this is sort of a little theater, street theater in Shakespearean times. So that is sort of. The thing one has in mind, a little bit like this, a public stage. Here there is a whole amphitheater to go, to go with it that we don't have, obviously. And <coughs> so there is see, there are this little podia here, and uh, there is a bicycle pass, and that's our little edicule. And these are uh, these steps, I mean, they come from the Swiss designer of. Uh, Public theater and in the street, what was it? Adolf Appia, Appia, Adolf Appia. I mean, you have to look up Adolf Appia. I mean, it's so much feeling in these things, a melancholy. Yeah? And uh, so we look at that, <coughs> and this is uh, looking at, looking to the street, and there were these people from the uh, Biennale. Uh, and uh, they were sort of watching how many people are, uh, are taking notice of this, and they were explaining what this is. This was a Biennale uh, organized thing. Uh, and in the end, what, how many people saw this? 900,000. 900,000 people saw this thing. Huh? Amazing. Huh? And so this is, uh, little, this is another piece. That's at down. the other end of the pavement, of the memory pavement. We made a gate to go across the street and with new kind of zebra crossing. Uh, and uh, this was one of the concerts. <coughs> and that's how it looks at night. OK, that's it. Thank you. And that's it. That's uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> the bird. But there yeah. is a house with the entrance of the right size for these. The magpies are for um, good, good luck in Korea. Good luck, yeah. yeah when, when there's two magpies. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We haven't seen them yet. Yeah, if, you're, if there's a time for questions. Yeah?
Um, so you, wait, I don't say it again. The question is, did some of the <laughs> No, for example, the, the roads that go basically north and south that were the farming, be the roads between farm fields, ah. yeah, yeah, we, they didn't exist anymore. So they weren't there at all. They had been obliterated by the military people and by, um, uh, by time, yeah? So those were not evident anymore in any form. Apart from the structure of the suburbs and the fields to the south, the farm fields to the south, they have that structure. The surrounding district has that structure. But they weren't on the site itself, and you couldn't see that anymore. So we've recovered, we've re- um, We've kind of um, remade something from history that was there but isn't there anymore. Yeah, as a, as a, so that's something which we, you know, it's a bit like um, we went to see the Neues Museum today and the one wing was completely bombed. Yeah, and they didn't have the drawings from the 19th century of what that those rooms were like. Yeah, so they rebuilt it though. Um, in the form that it was, thereabouts, yeah, and that's what we're, that's what we were doing. We're re, we're putting it back in place what it used to be like, and but not exactly. Putting back a memory of these things, yeah, uh, not the real thing, a memory of it. And <clears throat> but that's it's not really your question, is it? You're asking. Yeah, I mean. One of the, um, the boundaries, you saw it in the model photograph, were long lines of poplar, tall poplar trees. You know, and they are windbreak um, lines that you see around Berlin, especially um, in the tel Telto. You see these long windbreak lines made of poplars. And we, so that's something which we used as some of the boundaries um, between the fields. Yeah, so that's something which a kind of landscape element that is already existing, a kind of ready-made element that is recognizable and understandable. Yeah, I think that's one partial answer to your question. It's we, we're, we're not only bringing new things into the site from outside, like these housing houses, house forms. Some of the things are there already, like the railway direction. Uh, we didn't mention that the military had, the Americans had built big conc concrete roads, heavy concrete roads, and we reused those for the main roads against great opposition from the client. And, um, and but other things um, you have to bring in which are fresh and they don't exist in the site. And there's a kind of marriage between the new things and the existing things, I think. I, but I, am I answering your question? <laughs> um, one hopes, yes, that that in the experience, especially of the of the what we call the landscape infrastructure, that one can get a sense, not necessarily of the specific histories that we've uncovered, but of the nature of that place. It's come from that place. Yeah, it's not just a new kind of grid that's laid over it from an, an abstraction from, from nowhere, yeah? So that's, I guess, what you mean, isn't it? Can, what, can one experience after the, at the end a kind of understanding of what was there, you're asking? Or, and I th we would hope, yes, by the fact that it's come out of the place. A lot of it, most of it has come out of the place. Or in, the, or in the case of the Paju, by acknowledging the motorway embankment as a man-made piece of topography that's given, um, the a, a major element of the structure of the city, this kind of datum level in, within the buildings, 
is given by that existing um, topographical artificial topography that's already built, yeah, that, by, that, by the embankment element. So it's coming from what's already there. So we are ex very, very uh, uh, passionate uh, contextualists. We are trying to sort of sniff the ground. Huh? Yeah, uh, you know, almost like this, and uh, yeah, it's you know that is that's what it is. You know, it has this and this smell, huh? and it has this and this phenomenons, uh, and and uh, we want to uh, bring something into in response to these existing conditions, and in memory of these conditions when they if they are not there anymore. What anymore? So that uh, that the thing that uh, the new uh, city piece it, it comes from the place. That's did you can you accept that? <laughs> That's the, uh, the basis. I mean, I can go home and say, say I haven't I haven't been able to get that through to them. But you know, maybe in the end, um, maybe in the end, you go to that new wing of the Neues Museum, and you, you, somebody who remembers what it was the old one, yeah, still still living, they they might say, no, this is nothing like what the old one was like, and they'd be right probably. It's quite different, yeah, the new wing, yeah, the new rooms, and maybe that's okay too. You know, because it's it's not it's not a reconstruction of the past, um, a kind of renovation, a, a, a re um, a replaying of the past. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be for the present. But the past has something to inform it, to give it um, some meaning and some substance, and can and can informs it, informs the design of it. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess the question was brought about um, big, like floating rail tracks or, or like field ways contains any quality for residential like buildings or, or planning for doing. Because I mean, rebuilding a museum is like you had a museum that was destroyed, you put a new one there, it's still a museum. But like, I guess where they were going is like in looking at the structures or like the layouts of, of fields and agricultural <coughs> structures. Sense, well, you know, the, um, the, the difficulty with the Lichterfelder project was that the brief was for residential only. Or they had some public buildings that they wanted, but it was too um, zoned. Too much just kind of uh, 3,200 uh, dwellings they wanted, yeah? That's all. Yeah, and they wanted some schools and things, of course, they need, but, they, but that, was the, that was the pity that it's a kind of small-mindedness, that how can you make a new quarter of the city and it's just really just residential? I mean, um, it, today, it's, so in Samengum we're saying, no, 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 you make new quarters of the city and they have tourism and industry and commerce and, in, and farming and everything in them, yeah? Um, and it's, it, they're right rubbing up against each other because today, Industry is not dirty any, or most industry is not dirty anymore. You can have industry in the same building as where you live, yeah, or in the same block. And so, um, so program for us is not generator of form. Form does not follow function as far as we're concerned. We don't believe that. We think form comes from the site, from the conditions of social and, and, and political um, conditions and, and, and physical conditions of, this, of the place first. You make good space in the building or between the buildings first. And then you say, oh, this could be used as a school or as, as a playground or as a, as a factory. The building should be able, if in principle, the building should be generous enough to accommodate different um, uses. Those are the good buildings. 
And when they're designed like a machine, so you've made this factory and it's got exactly the right number of rooms, exactly the right number of sizes, exactly arranged so that this factory production can, can work in it, and it's so specific that it has to be demolished because it, somebody comes and wants to build an, turn it into an apartment building. Well, okay, that's reality, but it's pity, pity especially if it's in the city, um, it seems to us. And when you find buildings that um, we have in, for example, you have them in Berlin, but in, we have them in London, these ones that were done in the 18th century, they were built as houses around v generous squares. They were built by developers. And they were, you know, they were hard-lined uh, businessmen that did it, but they, and landowners, but they did it with a sense of a kind of generosity for um, the buildings. And these houses, are now used for all sorts of workplaces and for houses and for schools and so on. They are good buildings. They have good rooms and good arrangement of rooms and good relationship between the rooms and the public space such that they can be in different times in history reused, reinvented slightly. They have to be adapted, but not uh, rebuilt completely. And that's to me wonderful, I think, that, um, that an architecture can adapt itself to the future that we don't know what the future will be, but it still can adapt to itself to it. And Let him, yeah. let him. So the program for us is not um, important in the beginning of the design. It's only used to test the design in, later on in the, in the project. And that's what we tell our students. And that's how we run our projects with our students. We, t we don't give them a program. Um, as a brief. We give them a, a site and they come up with programs and then we say, okay, try another program <laughs> and try another one and see if, you, if your building is still works. You know. Try a school and you're tr it's, but it's supposed to be an apartment building. Or try an apartment building if it's supposed to be a school. You know. Thank you. Uh, uh, for us, I mean, the, uh, the Berlin project was quite, quite a bit more crude than the, uh, uh, than the Korean project. Uh, we have made a lot of learning in the Berlin project, yeah. and we have improved in the Korean project. Thank you.